papermen meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers, plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Ting-a-ling-ling, city desk, pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it, it's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. The Media Project is a half hour of commentary and analysis on what's going on in the news media today, and we have a rather special edition that I will explain to you all in just a moment. I'm Rex Smith, formerly editor of the Times Union, here with Judy Patrick, the former editor of the Daily Gazette, vice president of the New York Press Association, and Ian Pickus, the news director of Northeast Public Radio, WAMC. And now our listeners are accustomed to hearing us talk a lot. Too accustomed. Too accustomed, yeah. We're, we're just old hat. We have a special guest today that is Anna Wolf from Mississippi Today, a terrific not-for-profit newsroom in Mississippi, the statewide news organization for Mississippi, where she has been a reporter since 2018. Anna Wolf is here in our studio because she received an award called the Nellie Bly Award for Investigative Reporting here in Albany. And she also, by the way, a couple of weeks after we announced she would get that, won the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting. How cool is that? So welcome. Thank you. That? Yeah. And why don't you tell us, if you would please, what briefly your Pulitzer Prize winning investigation uncovered? Yeah. So it deals with a massive misspending scandal, theft scandal in Mississippi regarding federal welfare funds. So dollars that are supposed to go serve the most vulnerable families in one of the poorest states in the country. In 2017, it was really when I started looking into this issue, we found out that almost 99% of people who were applying for cash welfare were being denied that assistance. They weren't getting it. And just a very small fraction of those dollars were actually being used to serve people through direct cash assistance. So my big question was, where is the rest of the money going? And for years, kind of hit walls trying to figure out you know, where this money was going. There wasn't a lot of record keeping. Um, there wasn't a lot that I could get my hands on to show, you know, what we were getting for this amount of money that we get every year from the federal government. An auditor's investigation ensued. Folks were arrested, including the former head of the welfare department that it was administering this program. But I think the big question after that was, you know, how were the state's top officials involved in essentially creating this slush fund out of public assistance funds in Mississippi? And so it was kind of my goal to examine the former governor's role since his office was directly over the welfare's office. This was something that officials and investigators had not divulged to the public. In 2022, I was able to get my hands on some text messages that showed conversations between the former governor, Phil Bryant, and oddly enough, former NFL quarterback, Brett Favre, where they were discussing trying to get public support for a pharmaceutical company that they were investing in and wanting to lure to Mississippi as well as building a volleyball stadium at USM, University of Southern Mississippi, where they both went to school. And those would be later discovered as two projects that received over $7 million in welfare funds. In welfare funds. And incidentally, Brett Favre's kid was a volleyball player, right? Correct. Uh, the beneficiary of having that great volleyball court. By the way, interestingly, probably the Brett Favre connection gave a lot of attention to the story because he's a celebrity, right. which I think we all as journalists know that kind of thing will make a story come alive. But that's probably a bit of a frustration to you because it's a much broader story than corruption involving Brett Favre. Absolutely. You know, this didn't happen in a vacuum. Brett Favre wasn't able to, you know, lobby for these funds just because of who he was as a person. That made it easier, but this was already going on. It had been going on for years and years where this fund was targeted for, you know, essentially being a slush fund for the governor and his political allies. You know, I want to bring in my fellow panelists here because there's a really interesting phenomenon that is here, and that is that Anna's a young reporter. Obviously, you had spent three years at Jackson Clarion Ledger before you joined Mississippi Today. Your reporting began in about the third year of your professional experience. Is that right? Something like that? Mm -hmm, yeah. 
three so, or four. So, you know, oftentimes Judy is kind of shaking her head. We've run newsrooms and sometimes it is that energy of a young reporter and the freshness to a beat that can bring a story forward. Right? It's, re- it's remarkable. Let's be clear, as people who've run newsrooms, to have someone be fairly new to the job, be able to stick with a complicated story with so many obstacles you must have faced and be successful, it's just remarkable. We're big cheerleaders for local journalism here, and I'm, I'm thinking... If you had not written this, would this corruption have been exposed at all? Was anyone else, were there state officials auditing this? Or is this what, is your work what made this come forth? I think that's hard to say as a reporter, right? I think like we're, we're a domino, right? Yeah. Um, but there were certainly people who were raising questions about it. I just think that the pressure coming from someone that had the pen really, I mean, frankly, what happened is that I was pressing the agency and specifically kind of pushing this one agency employee that I was able to be speaking with. And he was the one who gathered the evidence and took that to the higher ups that began the auditor's investigation. So, you know, while I was just trying to figure out what was going on behind the scenes, that's what was occurring in this investigation ensued, you know, without me knowing about it until the arrest occurred. Right. Were you getting stonewalled a lot? Oh, yeah. I would get records back to records requests that didn't make any sense. You know, the numbers didn't match up and they didn't say anything that I was looking for. And I couldn't get them to explain, you know, what the records were, why they didn't show what I was looking for. And and can you talk a little bit about the role your editors might have played in supporting you throughout this investigative process? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I have a role at my paper where they've allowed me to kind of just go off and, and do what I need to do, right? And there were a lot of times it felt like we didn't know if this work was going to result in anything, if we were going to ever get an answer. And I think, especially moving into 2022, which is when this series was published, I was encouraged by my editor to really just go ahead with information that I had about the former governor in particular, because we felt that the public needed to know these things and that publishing what we knew at the time, even if we didn't have every answer to every question, was the right thing to do. And that's an interesting point, because sometimes, well, especially, Ian, in radio, you have the (laughs) deadline of the moment. You have Mm -hmm. airtime to fill. And you have to go with what you've got, as the old journalism axiom goes, even if you don't have the whole story. But that's a hard thing to do if you're the newsroom decision maker. Yes, let's publish, let's air, when you don't think you know everything you'd like to know. It's a huge pressure. And a lot of times, I think it's fair to say, we say, hey, we'll get back to this when we have more or we're ready. And that day never comes. And you have (laughs) to make peace with that, that this might be the one bite at the apple. I have a a question for you, and just to piggyback on what Judy said, you know, a lot of times when we have younger reporters who are starting out, it's, you know, certainly something that I dealt with early on. When you confront big institutions, they have a way of taking you aside and saying, hey, look, you, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't want to upset the apple cart here. How did you deal with that kind of pressure? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely my experience. A lot of like gaslighting and being made to feel like my questions were stupid, that they didn't make any sense and I didn't know what I was talking about. I think to go back to that about the energy from a young reporter, I think it's more so like people in journalism, they form an idea about what a good journalistic story is and they go after those stories. So it's all about, you know, what's happening at the legislature and who's donating to campaigns and state contracts and these things, policies that lawmakers are passing. And it's like no one was paying attention to these big state agencies. No one was paying attention to how these bureaucrats were basically running these whole systems. These aren't politicians. They're, you know, career government officials who are running the programs that put the most money out of any programs. Medicaid is an agency in Mississippi that is larger than the entire state budget of Mississippi. The Department of Human Services, which is the agency I investigated, administers about a billion dollars in federal funds. And these were agencies that just no one was talking about, looking into, basically taking anything that they said, taking their word for it, writing whatever they were saying that they were doing and not actually examining to see if, you know, they were accomplishing what they said they were. And this goes to the question that we often talk about in the show, which is the stakes, the results of the decline of the enterprise of journalism. The fact that so much of journalism through our history has been for profit. And when the profit began to vanish as a result of the digital revolution, there was no place ultimately for publishers and producers to cut the biggest sap of money, which is payroll. 
And the result is, I, I suppose you've seen this even in the years that you've been reporting in Mississippi, the number of journalists has so dwindled that mm-hmm. there just aren't people to do much of the deep reporting. And in its place has come this ecosystem of not-for-profit newsrooms around the country, of which Mississippi Today is a terrific example. And there are a few in New York. For three years, you've had a new newsroom called uh, a New York Focus, which is underway. You know, in Vermont, there's Vermont Digger. There are a number of them. But the difficulty of having a news organization that will send an Anna Wolf and say, yes, go ahead and take the time to do this because we can fulfill our other mission with people who are writing daily stories, right? Right. You have to have both. I'm not sitting here saying that like this kind of long form investigative work is all that we need as readers. Right. And I think Mississippi Today was definitely created, you know, with the idea of filling that hole for sure. The legacy kind of statewide newspaper in Mississippi, it's a Gannett paper. It's kind of a shell of itself at this point. I think they've got three news reporters covering the entire state of Mississippi. So think of that, folks. Now, are you over and done with the story? Or are there more chapters to be written? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's far from over. You know, as far as the criminal investigation goes into the scandal, there have been seven people who have pleaded guilty, but none of them have been sentenced. None of them are in prison. So that definitely signals to me that the investigation is ongoing and that they could be providing information that has kept them from being sentenced thus far. And are poor people in Mississippi receiving the money that they should be receiving in any degree yet? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the sad thing. It's not like Mississippi is, is required to give a certain portion of this fund in, funds, you know, directly to people through cash assistance. So ironically, the number of people who are actually being served through the cash assistance side of the TANF program is a lot fewer even than when the scandal was occurring today. So, you know, I think that their focus with cleaning up the agency has been putting these controls back in place, making sure that embezzlement and fraud is not occurring. But as far as whether or not that's created better outcomes for people who need assistance from the agency, I'm not sure that that's happened. Right. TANF is temporary assistance to needy needy families. families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. One of those acronyms that people don't have any idea what it is, uh, but it is a, an important program. And I think that's part of the difficulty of being of doing journalism around some of these things. It is, the arcania mm-hmm. of government is hard to even begin to explain to people. And when you talk about TANF and how the funds are diverted, it is very complex to try to get that across. And yet if you don't really try to simplify it and make it clear to readers, you're not fulfilling a journalistic mission, right? Yeah, I think the thing that I keep coming across in Mississippi, and maybe this is everywhere, is just these programs and functions of government that have been so forgotten and ignored for so long that they've kind of just devolved into like some other thing that isn't what they were originally intended to do. So for example, I I worked on a story a few years ago where we found out that people were being sentenced to serve time in these facilities that were not prisons. They were called restitution centers where people were forced to live and they would be like bussed in an MDOC van to McDonald's every day to work off their debts. And their How money would be taken. How recently was this happening? How recently was this? This is happening now. And it was three years ago that I published the story about it. Okay. Now that we could not find another example of this across the nation. Of course, these things were set up as alternatives to prison. But instead, people were ending up there who were not in prison to begin with, strictly to pay off their their court fines and fees and debts that they were working at McDonald's and their whole paychecks were being taken by the Department of Corrections to pay off their debts, which meant that because they were sentenced there not for an amount of time, but for an amount of money, that it was an open-ended prison sentence, depending on how quickly you could earn money. I'm sorry, this is still going on? These facilities still exist. They are not being used quite at the same rate, but that was mostly due to COVID. I'm not going to take credit for that. You know, this is just like Reconstruction. This is exactly what happened to formerly enslaved people in the South during Reconstruction when they would be imprisoned and turned into forced labor for private enterprise in the South. And I did not realize it was still going on today. Isn't that stunning? Yeah, it's a good example of where people had just forgotten about it. In fact, I had found articles, you know, while I was working on the story, where people had written about these places, 
but they just wrote about them as if they were prisons, like those people were prisoners, and they didn't take the time to really see what was actually going on here and realize like how people were being sentenced here and what it meant for them and their families. This yeah. is what journalists do, you know? <laughs> this is why you <laughs> need journalists, because these things are happening. Lord knows what's happening elsewhere, but unless you have a fresh set of eyes looking mm-hmm. at something, these, exactly. these things are allowed to continue. But it's so difficult to focus enough attention on it because that strikes me as a clear injustice that is just stunning. I think Rex is astounded. I think we've, you've astounded <laughs> I actually, him. I actually know that my jaw just <laughs> dropped because the nonfiction work, uh, How the Word is Passed by, um, what's his first name? His last name is Smith. Anyway, it, it talks about the continuing institutional racism in America, which I read just a few months ago. And I remember reading about this as an historic artifact. I just didn't realize mm-hmm. that this kind of thing was going on where people put into the justice system, that is what we call it in this country, uh, nevertheless are then forced, in effect, into employment right. m- without wages. And yet, how do you deal with something like this if, if a reporter uncovers it? And then, then you have to go on to the next story because there are more stories. Right. Uh, uh-huh. Well, and think about like McDonald's, right? Like they were hiring these people. So I go and talk to them and they think that these people are living in a halfway house. They don't realize that they're forced to live there until they earn enough money to get out. Like no one is paying attention. I think that that's the root of most of these stories. Gobsmacked. This is the Media Project from Northeast Public Radio. I'm Rex Smith with Judy Patrick and Ian Pickus and here today with Anna Wolf of Mississippi Today, the not-for-profit newsroom covering what's going on in Mississippi. And actually, I want to turn to a different topic a little bit, but it, it, because I knew you were coming, Anna, I was struck by a, almost a parallel. I was reading a great column by uh, Lydia Polgreen, the New York Times columnist who by the way, began her career as a reporter at the Times Union in Albany. Lydia was writing about the photography coming out of Hamas, which we don't see much of, frankly, in the mainstream media. And she was saying that we should not look away, that it is our moral obligation to bear witness to the images of war. But this is also difficult because it can seem like we are taking advantage of people in difficult situations. She was particularly interested in a photograph that showed seven young girls, the bodies of seven young girls lying slightly uncovered beneath a sheet. And I thought about you're a reporter who covers poverty, where there are victims, in effect, people who are living in poverty. To enliven your stories, to put the human face on it, you need to use these people. I recall writing a story about rural poverty some years ago when I was an experienced reporter. I knew better than what I actually did. But I wrote about this couple who lived out in the country, and the phrase that I used was, Their home was a shack, really, down a rutted road within view of the highway. I wrote that, and the second day after it was published, the woman I had interviewed called me weeping that I had described her home as a shack. Mm -hmm. It's a cottage, she said. It's a cottage. And I felt so terrible because I had wanted to evoke the emotional impact of a shack in the country. And yet, there she was. I had taken her cottage and turned it into a shack. I think you probably encounter this often when you're uh, writing about people who are in dire straits, thinking, well, I'm almost further victimizing them, right? Right. I understand that. Did you have a photo with that story? I did not use a photo, no. So I have a photographer that I work with. His name's Eric Shelton. He is fabulous. I find that the way that he photographs subjects that I'm working with really it helps me actually write a better story because I see them in the light that he's putting them in and I don't know if it's like camera angles but like these people look like celebrities sometimes I mean they look like they're in charge and I just love that because I think the the antidote to what you're talking about is to you know write people as empowered people right don't write them as a victim they're going through something but they are people with dignity, and I think placing them in that kind of empowered light is is the way that we can solve that. The story you're talking about reminds me of something that happened not too long ago in September. 60 Minutes did a segment that kind of juxtaposed the city of Jackson, where I live, and Colorado, where a football coach who was at Jackson State had left to go to Colorado, and they were kind of talking about these two places. And I actually didn't watch the segment, but supposedly they kind of had like a drone kind of shot of part of Jackson that was run down and abandoned houses, you know, cracked windows and and that kind of thing. And the Jackson City Council actually passed a 
resolution after this um, to denounce the episode and how it portrayed Jackson. I don't see the the value in that, right? Um, like, and this is my home too, so I'm talking about where I live as well. Yeah, we have to be careful about these images that we show and and the context that we're placing them in, right? Of course, we're in Albany. We're accustomed to that. You know, we get picked on all the time by the downstate. <laughs> oh, it's just Albany. You know, this will come up next week, Thanksgiving week, where you have to raise the question, would you cover the, the Thanksgiving meal for the needy? And you bring cameras and microphones in and, and put people who couldn't afford their own turkey dinner, do you put them on the mm -hmm. nightly news? And are we taking advantage of them when we do that? I question that every year. Um, the people typically are more than happy to talk to us, but it does put them in a light, gets a negative light. And I think it seems to me like we're taking advantage of them. Back to the 60 Minutes just for a second, <laughs> because any chance I have to talk about sports on this show, we'll take. <laughs> he um, will. He will. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, it was a story about a white fan base in the state of Colorado awaiting the arrival of Deion Sanders, probably the most captivating figure in college sports right now, the former two-sport star athlete who has now brought his coaching to the college ranks. And the story was making the point that HBCUs are historically underfunded. And when he was leaving, it was to go to an opportunity where it was an entirely different universe because that poverty was seen even at the college football level. And it was it was really interesting juxtaposition. And I can understand why the locals were unhappy with how things were portrayed, because even if it was the truth, you know, there had been a lot of success in the context of mm -hmm. uh, where Sanders started, you know? Yeah, I think that story was very layered, you know, because I think people from the outside were coming in saying that, like, he was our savior, you know, when really, like, we gave him the chance to do this job for the first time. That was his time, first right? job. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there were different opinions on that for sure. And now he, as we speak, is rumored to be in line for a job at Texas A&M. So we'll see if there are even brighter pastures ahead. <laughs> I can't wait to see the drone shots now. Uh, yeah, A&M and, uh, oh boy, that would be uh, an amazing venue for Dan Sanders. That's a big media market. I mean, that, that, that gets so much media attention. Okay, we need to take just a moment here to talk about a rather chilling moment. And we do talk about Donald Trump here sometimes, but it is in this context. There's a, an NYU journalism professor named Jay Rosen who's been trying to tell journalists that we're doing the wrong thing in our campaign coverage because we talk so much about who's up and who's down. He says, you should be reporting not the odds, but the stakes. Report the stakes, not the odds. That is, democracy is on the ballot, he says. And yet you get into a really difficult situation there because if you say democracy is imperiled, it's because Donald Trump recently, for example, in a speech in New Hampshire, uh, talked about vermin. His opponents are vermin, uh, which is chilling, let's say shocking. Yet if you don't call it out, are you doing the job? I think one of Rosen's big points is that he doesn't like the horse race coverage. And we've talked before about the fact that we don't like the horse race coverage either. There is some value to mentioning polls and who's who's ahead and what's happening here and there because that does affect the outcome of the election. But I tend to agree with him about the stakes that we need, especially because the former president, Donald Trump, is talking so clearly about what he intends to do. We need to talk about the stakes involved. And again, the use of heightened political rhetoric, rhetoric, we need to call that out and not just say, you know, Donald Trump called people uh, a bad word. We need to say the word vermin and, and put it in historical context. It's um, I think we have been too soft in our election coverage because we have tried to be nice. And I think we need to be far more blunt going forward. It seems like a two-edged sword to me, though, because the Washington Post had this headline saying, echoing Hitler and Mussolini, Trump campaigns in New Hampshire. How many times can you say that? It will be true virtually every time he speaks, probably in the next 12 months. Hitler so, and Mussolini, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he's campaigning like a, an autocrat, no question about it. Will that have an impact the 300th time you read it? I don't know. When it's, uh, you know, it is because his rhetoric has been so violent lately, he calls, uh, uh, you know, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, once said he should be executed. He mocked the assault on Paul Pelosi. Oh, uh, he continues to do that. Yes. Right. Urges police to shoot shoplifters, suspected, uh, suspected shoplifters. 
that's a staple of his brand. And so as journalists, by reporting it, we actually risk it peeping people in your to it, don't we? You know, at some point of, over the last few days, I have thought that maybe he's just suckering us in again, you know, with by trying to keep on the front page with these uh, outrageous um, comments. I mean, the, the Vermin comment was clearly prepared. It was written because he talked in a complete sentence and there was a predicate, a, <laughs> you know, a, a full clause there. And, and he tweeted the full clause. So this was intentional, definitely intentional. It wasn't a slip of the tongue. This is a deliberate strategy um, on his part. And are we getting suckered in? Um, we may very well. He Sometimes I think he may be the smartest person around when it comes to manipulating the media. So, Anna, set us straight here, we coastal elitists. Um, what's the view in Mississippi on this? <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm not a political reporter, but I just don't know what to do with this information. I mean, I think... If I could equate it to the recent uh, governor's race, you know, it's not our job to sway elections. It's not our job to tell people who to vote for or tell people how to feel about these things. It's to inform them on the policies and the things that will affect their lives based on who is elected. So in Mississippi, um, you know, one of the biggest issues of the race was Medicaid expansion, the just huge population of uninsured Mississippians who would be who would get health coverage under a leadership who expanded Medicaid and the fact that the current governor and the incumbent who was just reelected, you know, has promised, has vowed to never expand Medicaid and the impact that that has on on all of our neighbors. That's more important to me. That's, I think, the crucial value that we bring as far as informing people. Okay. Well, that has to be our last word today. We are out of time. I'm very grateful to Anna Wolf of Mississippi Today for joining us on the Media Project today. Judy Patrick is here. Ian Pickus. I'm Rex Smith. We are grateful to our producer, David Gustina, and especially to you folks who have joined us once again this week on the Media Project. When they know they've got a people's fight to wage, tingling-a-ling newspaper guild, got a free new world to build, meet the people, that's a thrill, all together fits the bill. Oh, newspaper men are such interesting people, it's wonderful to represent the world. The Media Project is a national production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union editor and current Substack columnist of the Upstate American, Rex Smith, Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette and vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association, WAMC News Director Ian Pickus, and special guest this week, Anna Wolf, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from Mississippi Today. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcast. I'm your producer, David Gustina. Thanks for listening. That payoff, what a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give three cheers of freedom of the press. <laughs> <laughs>